Okay, everybody, uh, thanks for coming to this uh, status update of the HelenOS project uh, from uh, 2016. My name is Martin Dietzky. Actually, this talk should have been presented by Jakub Jermáš, uh, but the, the, unfortunately he fell ill uh, this week. Uh, nothing serious, just an influenza, but still it, it was hard for him to make it to FOSDEM, so he asked me if I can jump in in the last minute. Uh, I hope that this won't affect the quality of the talk too much, so uh, let's start. Uh, before I dig into the technical details, let me just refresh you. Uh, some of you might not uh, know what HelenOS is, so let's have a brief introduction. These are some adjectives that might describe HelenOS in a nutshell. It's an open source, general purpose, multi-platform, multi uh, sorry, microkernel, multi-server operating system designed and implemented from scratch. And of course, you can download the sources and also some binaries at our website, which you, you, you see up there. Well, let's dig a little bit deeper. So open source uh, means that uh, our own code, the, the bulk of the code base has the BSD license, the new BSD license, and we also use some third party components, which we don't link directly to, but which we use uh, indirectly, which are under GPL. General purpose, that means that we don't uh, want to be biased towards any particular use case or any particular deployment. We want to create an operating system that is as useful for servers, desktops, uh, embedded systems, as for any other particular use case. Multi-platform, we country support these seven hardware architectures. Uh, this is our nomenclature, but I, I believe you, you can understand the abbreviations. Uh, you might remember from last year that I have, I said eight architectures. Nowadays it's seven. That, that's because we have removed one. We have removed the Spark uh, V8, the 32-bit uh, Spark variant, because we lost access to this special kind of hardware. It's being used mostly in, in, uh, in the space domain. And uh, also the emulators for this platform are very hard to get if you don't want to pay $1,000 a year. So uh, to lower our maintenance burden, we have removed this architecture, but it might come back sometime later. It's a microkernel, obviously. I mean, yes, we are here in the microkernel dev room. Let's not talk about it. It's a multi-server. That means that the entire system is uh, composed from fine-grained components. Uh, and uh, if, you are, if you are looking for a fancy a buzzword describing this software architecture, it's microservices. And it really is. I mean, it's, a, it's an operating system built out of microservices. And the, the longest adjective designed and implemented from scratch, uh, we do really mean it. So, so in, in the core components, in the kernel, in the user space, we don't use any borrowed code we design the system in a way we see the most fit in 2017. So uh, our native API tries to reflect our ideas of uh, how, how, an how a modern operating system should be designed. We don't have a goal of implementing uh, legacy APIs. Uh, because we really believe that there is no better Linux than Linux. There is no better Windows than Windows. We don't want to be uh, better Linux than Linux. Uh, we want to be the best microkernel operating system. On the other hand, of course, for practical reasons, f for pragmatic reasons, from time to time we do need to port some, some uh, applications and libraries from these legacy systems. So we do have an adaptation layer for porting, and we have some ported components, uh, but uh, this is a totally different topic. So this, this is uh, 
an image that you probably aren't able to read in detail and it's fine in such a way because I don't really want to go into the architecture right now but it somehow shows the total composition of the system it's not not draw in, it's not drawn in scale so this is this is the entire microkernel and these boxes might sometimes represent uh, a few functions or even a single function so this is really not not a, not a, a component but it shows that even our microkernel has some internal structure it, it's divided into uh, into the large architecture independent part which implements uh, everything in the same way on all architectures and there is uh, an hardware abstraction layer and then there is the part that is uh, platform specific it's uh, roughly 10 to 15 percent of the kernel so we really try to make our code base as generic as possible and then th this this entire microkernel is shown here as this single component of the system and then you can see the other components here and even even composed components like a file system uh, composed component which logically contains all the other primitive components inside of it one note uh, for example, the networking is uh, also decomponentized. So basically, if you know the networking reference model, the physical layer, link layer, uh, transport layer, and so on, this is exactly the way how our networking stack is structured physically. So there is a separate component, separate task running in isolation from the other tasks in the networking stack for each each of the networking layer. Just to give you some, some rough idea, in total, this is really not just the kernel, but in total, this is the size of the code base. This is some rough estimate of, of the work effort. Of course, this is totally wrong because the basic Kokomo model is not really suited for, for, for systems or system software, but it can give you some idea. And uh, except uh, of, uh, let's say, six to eight core developers, this has been developed in the course of uh, some 24 master theses, four bachelor theses, 11 Google Summer of Code projects, and so on. So, so yeah, I, I should really mention our contributors here because we are eternally thankful for them. Okay. Now you might think these are cra some crazy people who are just trying to reinvent the wheel and this has no sense of uh, really making, giving any attention. Uh, let, me, let me explain it from a uh, different perspective. Uh, the legacy operating systems, of course, they are working. They are working quite well. I would say, but uh, uh, their designs and APIs are in many cases broken, insecure. Uh, the, at the very least, they are morally, morally obsolete. And uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything is wrong with, with Linux or that, that uh, there is no hope of taking inspiration in, uh, in uh, principles or in implementations that have been around for, for many years. I've, I have spoken about this topic two years uh, back. But many things can be, can be designed in a better way with current software engineering standards and principles uh, by thinking out of the box, by not implementing yet another Unix, by not trying to reinventing Linux or, or creating new Linux. And also, uh, if I can slightly separate from my respected colleagues from other microkernel systems, we also think that it's important that we write the bulk of our system core components ourselves, that we don't import uh, drivers from, from Linux using some uh, driver, uh, driver device driver kits or RAMP kernels or whatever, because we are really afraid of Franken components. We don't want them. We want our components to suit our architecture, not to somehow glue them together using adaptation layers. 
if you don't get get my idea I'll show you these three pictures and let them sink for for a few seconds so we don't want this we want a nicely designed and engineered operating system okay let's move on uh, there's also another issue with uh, uh, borrowing components from, from other systems which we would really like, like to avoid and that's the maintenance bur burden of uh, the, these forked components. So once you, you fork something from, which is external, you basically create what Jakub Piermar calls software fossil. So it's, it's a snapshot of the code which uh, the upstream is no longer required to maintain or to update. You are required to do it and this creates uh, the possibility of uh, you forgetting or not, not managing to backport security fixes, new features. Sometimes you have to deal with diverging licenses and uh, all these kind of stuff. So the Helenos mainline, the, the, the microkernel and the core components, they are always fresh. They are always working in sync and they, are, they don't age. While the uh, HelenOS coastline repository, which contains the, the ported software I have spoken about, they, they tend to do this. And this for us really shows the difference between, between uh, creating the system in our own image and between uh, porting some Franken components from other systems. Uh, because the Franken components, uh, they don't follow our basic development principle to design something, then implement it, then run some verification tests on it, and then reiterating by learning from our own mistakes. Uh, let me do a short intermezzo here. We would really like to cross-pollinate. I, I think we, we, we try every time we can. So uh, last year, Jakub Jermar has created this uh, website, microkernel.info. Uh, and the idea behind it uh, is really to to join our forces with our fellow microkernel friends uh, with other projects. Uh, it has been inspired, by the way, by, by the website unikernel.org from the unikernel community. Uh, and uh, the purpose is the same. So it basically lists uh, in al alphabetical order the currently alive and and uh, uh, progressing microkernel operating systems everybody can be included i mean there are no 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 hard criteria for being accepted there's just a, just a brief brief over, overview of each of the systems and uh, and a link of course, the Unikernel guys, they, they went uh, already a little bit further, so their, their uni, unikernel.org website also contains some tutorials and some other helpful materials. We can also have it, we can also move in that direction, no problem with that, nobody just did it. So again, uh, your input from ev everyone here is more than, more than welcome. Really, the, the purpose is to create some, some quasi-neutral ground for our own microkernel advocacy. Uh, of course, it won't be totally neutral ever because everybody is somehow involved in in uh, some of these systems, uh, more or less. But but we we can at least try. And uh, if I can even say so, we have also the com we have also the common enemy, right? So we can join forces. Well, I, that was really more like a joke, but I mean, we are, I would say that we are more friends with the unikernel guys than we are with the monolithic kernel guys. Let's put it in that way. So again, please, uh, any contributions are welcome. And the other suggestion for cross-pollination, we have already discussed this in the, in the mailing list of this dev room, we would really like to uh, apply 
for this year's Google Summer of Code as an umbrella organization. I mean, uh, Helen West has some experience in Google Summer of Code. We have been accepted uh, three times, uh, and we were quite successful in GSOC. We weren't accepted five times. Uh, but still, Google Summer of Code is very, at least we see it as a very valuable uh, thing for for a niche software project because it really widens uh, the awareness or spreads the awareness of the project uh, mm, more than anything else, I, w I would say. So, uh, the, you know, the ratio between the acceptance and non-acceptance uh, we don't know why we were accepted in these years and weren't accepted in those years. I mean, obviously our application was was consistent. We didn't didn't just screw up in the other years. Uh, uh, everybody knows that uh, Google's uh, Google is not uh, sharing his or sorry its internal uh, criteria for accepting projects into GSOC. So we don't know what what's what's the problem for them. But we think, or at least we have a hypothesis, that uh, one issue might be that there is simply just a, a, an abundance or that there are too, too many operating system projects in general applying for GSOC. I mean, there is Linux, FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD, uh, Illumos, all, all you can have it. And uh, probably they don't quite distinguish between the monolithic systems and microkernel systems. So maybe, I, and I really believe that we should at least try, even if we don't succeed, an umbrella organization for for uh, all microkernel systems might help in, in this way. So we had already some, I would say, positive feedback from, from some other guys. So if if somebody wants to add, something to it here, let's, let's discuss it here or during the dinner. Just think about some of the technicalities. So the deadline of the application is approaching quickly. We can manage it, but uh, we have to really agree on, on this uh, sooner than later. So, so first question is who should fill in the application? Are there any volunteers? So we are volunteering. Yeah, we have some experience, so so we we can give it a try. I mean, obviously we won't do it uh, uh, like copy pasting for our own application, but we will try to give it uh, some some twist. Again, any input is more than welcome. Uh, where the idea page for for this organization should be hosted? I mean, I, I really think that the microcron.info is. Uh, is the perfect place to to host it. Again, please do send us uh, your your topics, your ideas for GSOC if you want to be included. I mean, the more topics, the better. Th that's that's probably the the key. Uh, if you do, if you need some inspiration, uh, I can send you I can send you links to our previous ideas pages, even from those years that we were really accepted. So you can you can. Uh, see some working example. And uh, the last question I would really like to ask here uh, to my colleagues, should we discourage individual applications from the individual projects? W what's your opinion on that? Right. Anybody, I mean, okay. anybody who wants to join this, if it's okay or not. So we haven't planned to join I think we have tried once or twice. But they are rejected, and for, for reasons that I don't know. And Nobody knows. Um, so we did not consider to apply another time. So I, and I, 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 I would like to know your experience about. You say that it's very valuable for Venenos, <coughs> and what, what I would like to know is how sustainable is the effect. Uh, so is this obviously that Google is paying money for people working on specific topics, but that's just a kind of a one shot uh, of money. But the question is, is does it, does it uh, suffice to uh, uh, ignite the interest of, the, of those people so that they stick to the project? Or do they just do this kind of three months of work and then they disappear magically? Because then I would say the investment of uh, mentoring is, uh, is not so efficient because it has not, not a sustainable <coughs> effect. 
That's your so, so my experience, th there are two two layers in your question. The one layer is whether it is worth the, the, the short short term shot, the short term investment. I would say still yes, because uh, the usual, at least in our case, the usual uh, GSOC project creates roughly the same amount of code as a master thesis. But a master thesis can take a year or two years to 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 be finished and sometimes even never gets finished. In GSOC, the same amount of work gets done by the student in three months. So if it if if it succeeds, it's quicker. If it fails, it's also quicker. So so from that point of view, it's uh, I w I would say it's worth the investment. And you probably also do some some uh, supervise some master thesis from time to time. So you know what I'm talking about. And about the long term, whether whether it really ignites some students to to stay with the community, yeah. The the I would say the ret return ratio is not very high. It's something in our case something like ten to twenty percent of the students. But uh, it's still more than zero, meaning that these students or these people would not know about us without without uh, participating in GSOC. So it's uh, it's a net benefit still. Even if it's just marginal, it's a net benefit. So uh, I, I mean, uh, if this should fly, all that is needed is to come up with, I don't know, three, four interesting projects from each of the participating uh, projects in, in under this umbrella which is probably not so hard i mean you should probably have uh, some some ideas flying around for other purposes so just putting them in some shape that is somehow somehow acceptable might take i don't know 2 3 hours and so we will see of course i i i cannot guarantee anything but but i really think we should try and uh, if I may answer to, to my own question, I think we should not discourage uh, the individual projects for applying still because, I mean, uh, we don't know what the, the Google's criteria are, so they might see it as a problem that they are trying to have more stakes in, in the ballot, uh, or maybe not. We will see. We can even try to, in two years in advance in different settings and hope that we are not fighting an oracle, which which changes every time we will, we will i mean we can just try so if if uh, somebody is in please email me or email Jakub. we will we will just make it happen somehow so and everybody is welcome don't get me wrong i, li I like this idea because you mentioned this uh, word cross pollination yes and so far i think after all these years this really hasn't happened so much uh, between our projects so we had once uh, this kind of project there are Spark Quadrant Tunnel was brought together with Dino or he attempted. Also, I like this as a, uh, as a chance to bridge uh, bridges between the projects in some way. This is not even necessary. I mean, the Umbra organization is really something that, that covers multiple individual projects. I mean, GNU is doing that. I mean, the GNU is participating in GSOC in many years as an Umbra organization for various GNU-related or even GNU-unrelated projects. So this is just just uh, a single organization that, that supports... Uh, yeah. I, I, I think what... So I'm with the Patrick Software Foundation, and uh -huh. I think I really agree with your point. So what a lot of times happens is Google Summer of Code looks for formal organizations. So it can basically, and I don't know why, but you know, maybe it's because, you know, they like sort of how the money is managed or the guarantee that it won't be some, you know, random people or whatever. Yeah. But if you have a non-profit in the United States, it's actually much easier to get your project accepted. On top of that, uh, again, in ASF, the trick is that ASF always gets accepted because, you know, we're sort of one of the known you know, open source uh, organizations. And then you can basically have as many projects within the ASF umbrella as you want. Mm. So it's actually exactly. very beneficial. Yeah, that's my point exactly. So perhaps we should skip this discussion uh, to the offline time, but I just wanted to show this here. And again, everybody is welcome. So n now let's move to the real st status update of Helen OS. Uh, we are talking about the year of the fire monkey, which somehow coincides with the period from last FOSDEM to this year's FOSDEM, so that works nicely. Some general observation. Uh, yeah, 
there is slightly less activity on our side than in previous years, mostly because the core contributors are somehow distracted now, me included, so, so we don't have so much time to contribute to Helen OS. Uh, the, the, also, there are much less students, so we didn't participate in Google Summer Code, we didn't participate in ESA Summer of Code in Space, and there were only two master theses running compared to, say, six or eight in, in the previous years. And I would say we are somehow plateauing. Really, this is, this is the key, key message here. Uh, of course, I cannot claim that Helen OS is perfect and, and finished. That, that will never happen. But uh, uh, it's finished from some perspective that we don't lack any major subsystem now. So we have networking, we have sound, we have USB, uh, uh, I, no, you, you name it. So, so there is no, this, no, no big chunk of code totally missing. So we are more switching into the phase of optimizations, refactoring, and so on. And that's probably not so attractive to, to many people. So that's my explanation why, uh, why the output is uh, uh, smaller. This can be also illustrated on our traditional LNOS camp, which is our hackathon, which has been done since 2005. So not so long as the OpenBSD's hackathon, but also quite for, for a long time. And uh, this year, only some three developers participated. S there were some overlaps, but yeah, I mean, on average three. So this is, this is quite poor, but we managed to, to implement something. So what, what we are currently working on, or what has been done recently, uh, I was hoping to to make a release before FOSDEM, but then Jakub uh, went uh, fell ill, and I had to write those slides and so on. So I didn't manage, but I might manage tomorrow. So it might be a FOSDEM release. Yay! Uh, so we have done some improvements uh, on our Spark 64. Uh, support for Sun for You hardware. This has been uh, jointly done with uh, with parallel developments in QMU. So uh, we are very. Uh, it's hard to how to quantify, but we are somehow close to be really able to run uh, Helen OS on Sun for You in QMU uh, as on on physical hardware. This has been linked with uh, somehow generalizing our user space serial console. Code. So previously there were different uh, ways how to use user space or console on different platforms and this has been somehow unified. We have a simple installer which is uh, non-interactive, uh, maybe a little bit dangerous. It, it tries to not to uh, overwrite anything on your local hard drive but I, I will still not really run it uh, without consideration and it's it's basically a first step into re really deploying Glen OS uh, as as a permanent operating system so it currently targets QMU and works on these two platforms but it it includes a, a reproducible build of grub so we are re pushing this idea that our builds should be reproducible that you you, you should be able to run a single command on any platform on any 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 guest system and this single command should create the same binaries the the, the same the the same uh, uh, composition of components and so on and uh, of course the grub is one of the components that we don't link to but we use as a, as a bootloader so we build it also uh, finally, we have US, USB 2.0 support that has been in in writing for three or four years because one of the original authors of our USB stack decided that uh, he would like to rewrite it completely and he's more or less did with some input from us. Uh, so. Uh, it not only enables uh, USB 2.0, but it also opens a uh, much easier path to, to USB 3.0 and so on. We have op optimized our processing of uh, hardware interrupts in user space drivers. Uh, uh, originally, 
there was there, there might have been a large overhead if the device was uh, generating too many interrupts in a single in a single unit of time because each of the interrupts was translated to an IPC message and for each of this IPC message a new worker fibril was always created and then disposed which created the overhead so now now it works in much op more optimized way uh, basically it's coalescing the, the calls somehow so that uh, the fibril the, uh, the, the worker fibrils do not have to be created and destroyed every time uh, there's again much more to do here some fibril pooling might, might might help even in different workloads we have improved our dynamic linking, uh, especially with uh, the respect to the thread local storage handling. And we finally have dynamic linking enabled by default on AA32. So if you compile Helen OS for, for x86, it will be created, uh, uh, dynamic, dynamically linked binaries will be created by default now. Another, another uh, small improvement which uh, is somehow related with the thread local storage. F for a very long time, from the early beginning of HelenOS, we had this uh, ugly special syscall uh, for setting the TLS base address uh, uh, on, on x86 and on AMD64, basically because this, uh, this sets the, the uh, the FS or uh, GS uh, register, the selector, which is then used as the, as, the, as the pointer for the base address for the thread local storage. And this cannot be done, or this was, this was not possible to be done from user space, so there uh, had to be some way how to, how to deal with it. Uh, and we really didn't like it, of course. It's, it's an ugly thing to have uh, this stupid syscall just for the sake of one architecture. So uh, our current solution is uh, to have a different configuration of uh, the thread, thread local storage that uh, can live with with a static uh, configuration of the of the GS and FS segments, and only a pointer in in this uh, in this thread local storage structure can can uh, needs to be changed, and then this is used as the basic address for for the thread local area. Uh, there is even a better solution. We have discussed it with Jakub Mirmas, uh, how to do it uh, in an even more elegant way. Uh, there are these two new instructions since Ivy Bridge, which can be used to set uh, these two registers, or not, not these two registers, but basically the the uh, the. The, the 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 values of of the of the segments or the base addresses of the segments from user space uh, of course uh, on on older cpus this does not work so uh, how to do it in a generic way well it can be emulated so so if the kernel uh, receives an exception that there is an invalid instruction and it's this particular instruction it just can be emulated it in theory, it works nicely and it's elegant, but the performance is worse than, than the, our current, current uh, implementation with this GCC specific option. So we are still thinking about what should we do with that. And of course, we have been doing, like I already said, a lot of code refactoring. We have uh, fixed many bugs that have been discovered by, by uh, verification tools. Uh, we are still on the bleeding edge of the GCC tools chain. And uh, we have helped to discover a regression in QMU270 on, on ARM. Uh, yeah, risk five, I know. I have promised that it, this should be ready in 36 hours last year, and uh, frankly, I really didn't spend 36 hours to do it. So sorry, it's still not. S th there is some, there is some uh, skeleton code in the main line, so at least you can you can try whether the 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 Risk Five compiler is still compiling the sources, but it's still not. It's booting, but it's not doing anything past the initial kernel uh, initial initialization. Uh, 
if I may have one small excuse for that, uh, there have been some changes in the in the uh, specif in the privilege specification of Risk Five during the year, and they have been also changes uh, in the spike uh, simulator, which is something like a reference uh, implementation of the Risk Five platform. And some of these uh, changes were not explicitly tracked and documented. So, so it was really uh, a bad surprise that you compile you com compile the code, run it, and uh, then you have to debug it for for an hour to really understand what what went wrong, why it's not working uh, as it used to work a week ago. And uh, two, two final uh, items I would like to mention uh, a little bit in more detail. It's a service manager and uh, user space pagers. So we have, uh, uh, where, he is, where is he? Yeah, there he is, Michal, Michal Koutny, my, my former master student who implemented uh, the service manager for Helen OS as his master thesis. So yeah. I have already mentioned the term microservices. So naturally, a, a microkernel multi-server operating system is composed of services. But uh, this is an overloaded term. So we are talking about the system services now, like, like the microkernel servers. And there are also, you know, logical services. Like if you if you run an HTTP server or I don't know NFS server on your machine, that's a different kind of service, not necessarily tied to the to the architecture of the operating system. So, so this service manager for LinOS tries to combine these two uh, entities somehow together. So to have a unified look on, on the microkernel services and on the logical services. Uh, it is remotely inspired by system management framework or system D, please don't kill me. Uh, let's move on. So basically there are two, two new components. One is uh, doing the dependency resolving. So it basically starts and stops uh, the logical services according to some dependencies. These dependencies can be either explicit, so they can be specified in a configuration file in, in, some, uh, in some declarative way, similar to what you might know from other uh, system management uh, frameworks. And of course, there are those implicit dependencies that, that are built from the architecture of the composition of the of the microkernel services, so this is this is basically for more or less for free because uh, it it used to work without without this new component previously. Now it's just integrated into into one package, and uh, there are some some unit types, so like the the individual service instances that can be either a service, meaning a process. Uh, a mount point, a configuration, or a target. And uh, then there is the taskman service, which basically is monitoring the life cycle of, of the services and provides uh, a monitoring API. Uh, so it manages the uh, logical relationship between, between the the physical processes, because there is no such thing in Helen OS as, as, a, as a parent and child process. So this has to be created uh, on, on. This has to be created anew, and uh, this uh, service can later be used for restarting. For example, if if a service fails or something like that. So it's dependency part and lifecycle part. And the final uh, implementation piece that has been done is. Uh, uh, are the user space pagers. This is one thing that uh, uh, in, in which uh, Helen OS architecture differs from, from I would say most of the uh, L4 family operating systems which really focus on, on uh, uh, removing all memory management from the kernel except the, the privileged parts like, uh, right, like accessing the page tables and uh, managing the TLB. In Helen OS we have uh, decided to uh, have a different approach, to have a slightly more traditional architecture of the memory management with a kernel frame allocator, 
a kernel heap allocator, uh, which is a slab allocator, by the way, and uh, a virtual address space manager. Uh, it's still mostly mechanisms, so, so uh, there are almost no policies in the kernel. Uh, except maybe maybe some basic algorithms like single fit and so on uh, our our uh, motivation for doing uh, or for implementing uh, memory management in this way was that we believe that it's still a single point of fa failure so even if we push it out into user space the kernel would not survive or even for its own purposes if if the memory management service or the memory management server would fail in user space so in that case we don't see a major point uh, for not having this in the kernel itself so originally there were three address space area backends for uh, uh, mapping physical memory for devices because also the kernel needs to have uh, support to the hardware at least for for the timer then for anonymous memory that basically is used to give memory to the user space tasks and for for mapping elf binaries because the kernel during bootstrap needs to run some initial binary so it needs to uh, be able to to access that structure in some in some structured intelligent way and now there is uh, another backend which can forward page faults to user space basically so the current implementation is really quite straightforward there is a task that uh, needs to access some memory which is being provided by some other user space task uh, and it can be anything it can be for example the virtual file system provided providing memory mapped files so each of these tasks has uh, its virtual memory map in the kernel and uh, first uh, uh, the new address space area is created by by the client and it's a special kind of uh, virtual memory area which with with that user uh, user uh, pager then uh, this creates um, a dedicated ipc connection to the to the server and the server creates its uh, internal representation of, of this this client of this this request then if the client accesses the memory it touches the memory uh, within that uh, that uh, area that needs to be served by by the pager it naturally creates a page fault and this page fault is forwarded to the to the pager as an ipc message uh, while the, the page is blocked and now the pager asks the kernel to to give the client some part of its other space so it basically answers the IPC call by uh, the, this this uh, return value says that it's okay to to provide the memory to the to the client and supplies its virtual address of the piece of memory that it wants to provide this virtual memory is then translated to the physical address by the kernel and this physical address is then mapped to to the client and the client is woken up and that's it i mean now this this dot or this this uh, page is uh, alias to this page so it's a really quite straightforward implementation we have some additional ideas how to make it in in a more generic way in the future but f just for the purpose of implementing uh, memory mapped files this works pretty pretty nicely so any plans for this year for the year of the fire rooster yeah we have some research papers in the paper uh, in the pipeline we would like to finish them and submit them uh, i would really like to finish the risk risk 5 port uh, we have uh, uh, ongoing cooperation with with the cz nic that's the Czech uh, National Domain Registry. They have this nice project called Tourist Omnia. You might have heard about it even uh, on last FOSDEM and on this FOSDEM. So it's basically a very well designed uh, home or small office router. And uh, we would really like to 
fine tune Helen OS on this particular piece of hardware and then start some, some interesting collaboration with them. We would like to switch to the annual release cycle just because we are no longer in the phase that uh, we are waiting for this major subsystem to be written, that major subsystem to be written. Uh, it's probably easier to take inspiration from the genome guys where they simply release uh, often with, with new smaller, perhaps smaller updates. And uh, we have already done some IPC optimizations and again now it's time to really dig in deeper uh, and to, to, for example, implement some weight-free algorithms to improve the, the overhead uh, and so on. So that's basically all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer them, and uh, we can still discuss the, the GSOC stuff if there is some interest. Okay. Maybe later. Thank you.